First off, before we get into the uh, the meat and potatoes of the the webinar, a number of you have probably heard about the problem going on in Georgia right Georgia right now at the Constant Bluffs Bridge. Um, the drawbridge has been torn down, and they're building a, a a double a double bridge, a double high bridge at 65 feet. The problem is, is that at the moment they have to tear down the foundations of the old drawbridge, and that means that they're going to have to temporarily block the ICW. Now, initially, a week and a half ago, the plan was they were just going to block the ICW for seven weeks. Okay, now, and that mm -hmm. was supposed to start Monday, just past. Now, seven weeks at this time of year would be a disaster because there's going to be about 2,000 boats coming south at this time between now and the middle of November. Um, to hold 2,000 boats up for seven weeks would be just an unspeakable disaster. Well, they figured out that was wrong, and then they gave us a, a schedule, which is what you see on the right, where those yellow blocks are the hours of daylight that you would be able to cross through the Cost and Bluffs Bridge. There was a total of 12 hours of daylight that you'd be able to cross through. And that's that's ridiculous. It's, it's not going to work. So last Friday, uh, we uh, had a meeting with the, um, we, uh, by me, I mean a number of people in the, uh, the boating business. We had a meeting with the Georgia Department of uh, Transportation, and we explained our concerns and why what they were planning on doing was a very bad idea. Now, what has happened from there is that it looks like what we're going to get is, is going to be a set of two openings every day of the week instead of just four or five hours on two days of the week. Um, it will probably be something like you see there where you'll be able to get through between 11 and 1 o'clock, 11 and 2 o'clock, and then a, a later passage for an hour at the end of the day. That's not optimal, but it's workable, and we'll know more details tomorrow. Uh, the important thing is that it means that people who get caught, who are up at the bridge are not going to have to think that they're going to have to go offshore to get around it, or they're not going to have to try traveling on the ICW at night, which is something that nobody recommends, not for um, not for recreational boaters anyway. As I said, we have a meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Details on what is decided will be available on the Facebook sailing and cruising page, uh, which I assume you're probably all members of. There may also be a request for you to give your opinions on what's going on or your thoughts about what the right solution would be. Um, please speak out on this issue because it's important that the, the Coast Guard and the Georgia Department of Transportation is aware that people are concerned about this. The more people speaking out, the more likely we are to get what we need. Okay, as I was saying, if you wanna speak out, there's two places. One will be uh, on sa Facebook Sailing and Cruising. The other one is on the, the website, regulations.gov slash comment on, et cetera. That link will be on the sailing and cruising page tomorrow. Comments need to be submitted no later than October the 15th. Okay, so enough about the Cost and Bluffs Bridge. When you're traveling south, obviously you wanna know what resources are available. Now, the, the chart book I recommend, I didn't put a, a picture of it here, is the Kettlewell chart book. It's an eight and a half by 11 chart book. It shows nothing but the ICW. It fits very nicely in a cockpit, especially a sailboat cockpit. It's spiral bound. The only negative thing I can say about it is that it doesn't use uh, waterproof paper. It uses regular paper, but it's got all the information on it that you could ever need for, for traveling, for bridges, for depths, uh, for, for everything you could want to have. Now, another resource that I highly recommend people pick up is a copy of the Waterway Guide. And the two that you really need are the Atlantic ICW, which you see on the left of your screen, and the Southern Guide, which, is, which covers from uh, Florida south. Okay, now... They are not cheap, unfortunately, but they're they're really, really a good book, and they have all the information you could possibly want um, regarding marinas and regarding any shoreside activities and also any amenities that are required. One of the really invaluable things about the waterway guide is it has little chartlets of the of the harbors that you'll come to. And what these harbors, what these chartlets show is they show each of the marinas. So when you come into an, a new harbor and if you've done any bit of sailing at all you're aware of this when you come into a new harbor and you're looking around you think well they usually don't put a huge honking big sign up there saying joe's marina so you know where you're going okay you usually kind of have to guess and if there's three or four or five marinas in a particular harbor and that happens um you're, you're not necessarily going to be sure which one you're going to so the waterway guide chartlets of the harbors will show you 
exactly where which marina is where within a, a harbor. So very, very useful. It also shows you the approach depths. Uh, it gives you all of the various amenities that are available, whether they got fuel, whether they got diesel or gas, um, all of these sorts of things, whether they have ice, everybody wants ice at some point or another. As I said, they're not cheap, but if you get onto eBay or, or one of the um, online sites, you can often find last year's or the year's previous version for much less money. Um, most of the needed information, if you don't want to spend the money on the books, most of the needed information you'll want is on the Waterway Guide website, waterwayguide.com. And they also have an app, which you can download. And I recommend that you do. Uh, it's extreme. It, it's just information that you'll find yourself using all the time. Um, they do, the um, Waterway Guide has limited information on anchorages, of course, if what you're planning on doing is anchoring out a lot. The reason, of course, is that they make their money they make their money from um, selling advertising to marinas and, and businesses. They don't make any money out of, out of promoting anchorages. So they've got some limited information, but not a lot. Uh, the website actually is not too bad for, for anchoring information. Now, a tip for you, you can pick it up at the, um, the boat show for a discounted price. And just so nobody thinks I'm shilling, I used to be a cruising editor for Waterway Guide for probably 12, 13 years. Um, I used the Waterway Guide before I ever started writing for them. Uh, and I still highly recommend it. Okay, so moving on. Oops, okay. Another good resource is the cruisersnet.net website. Uh, it's completely online. They have no printed uh, material that they make available. They're very, very responsive. Um, if you send a comment or a question into them, uh, they will get back to you, or one of the uh, members will get back to you quite quickly. Uh, they also have a very up-to-date fuel price summary, which given the price of gas and fuel these days uh, can be very, very handy. Okay, moving on. Once you get off the Chesapeake, and if you look at the chart there, the yellow line shows you coming in off of the Chesapeake Bay. Now, when I get off the Chesapeake, I'm, prob I'm usually too tired to run, run all the way down into Norfolk. I usually hang a right and I go up to Hampton and I'll hang out at the Hampton Public Piers or I'll hang out in the Anchorage there. Um, it's, it's just a little bit shorter and I happen to like Hampton a great deal. It's a very pleasant little community. So that's the, that's the first stop that you can make run up to Hampton. Uh, otherwise you run down to Portsmouth and Norfolk following the red line, which takes you past the, um, the Naval Yard and you'll see all kinds of fascinating ships, uh, everything from, um, aircraft carriers to, uh, uh, uh if you guys are in the Navy, I'm probably gonna say it wrong, but, uh, attack ships and everything else. So it's really quite fast. And if you're lucky, you might even see a submarine. But I, I advise you, if you see a submarine, you can take pictures, but don't approach it. Anyhow, so Hampton, you've got a, a good little anchorage there. And it is a small anchorage, but you can get four, five, six boats in there. Uh, there are several available marinas. And they've got one thing that no other place on the entire ICW has. The Hampton Public Piers have got a shower that they make available to people who are anchored out. So, uh, and I think it costs a buck or a buck and a quarter. I forget now. Uh, I was about to say it's been a while since I've had a shower, but I should say it's been a while since I've had a shower there. Anyhow, I, I, I had a shower this morning, but not there. Anyway, um, so it's a lovely spot. Norfolk and Portsmouth, there are several marinas, of course. Uh, you can get further details on them from waterwayguide.com. There are two free docks in Portsmouth. And for more information on free docks, one of the, one of the websites that you want to be aware of is icwfreedocks.com. By the way, for you, those of you who are taking notes, if I go too quickly, don't panic. This will be put online uh, at the end of the night once it's uh, downloaded and I can um, um, uh, do a bit of editing on it. So anyway, as I was saying, to find out about free docs, go to icwfreedocs.com or the Facebook page, um, ICW Free Docs, which is run by uh, a good friend of mine, James Newsom. But anyway, in Portsmouth, you have two free docs. You have Portsmouth uh, North Landing, which is at 0.2 statute miles, and that's point to statue miles past hospital point, which is the beginning of the ICW. You also have the high street landing, which is at point three statute miles. Um, hospital point anchorage in Portsmouth is at mile zero. Of course, it's right where the ICW starts. Um, and as you, after you've left there and you start heading down, your your next stop, if you uh, go over the Virginia cut route, is going to Great Bridge. Great Bridge, you can anchor, sorry, not you can anchor, when you go through Great Bridge, once you're through the lock at Great Bridge, you can tie up on the right-hand side of the area between the bridge and the lock. Uh, there's lots of room to tie up there. It's not the uh, the most comfortable tie up, 
it doesn't have docks as we know them, but it, it is space and room to tie up there. Um, alternatively, you go through the bridge at Great Bridge, and on your left hand side, you'll see the Battlefield Park free dock. Hey, Rick. Okay, and just past the bridge and opposite uh, Atlantic uh, Yacht Basin. Now, if you decide to take the Dismal Swamp route instead, um, and keep in mind that the Dismal Swamp is limited in, de in uh, for draft, uh, the maximum you can handle there would be six feet. And if you go through it with six feet, you're probably going to be bumping a few logs in the way there. Even at five feet, you'll bump the odd one. Um, and it, it's not going to damage your boat. It's just the, the logs are on the bottom floating a bit off. So your, your keel clips it and then knocks it back down. Um, anyway, the Dismal Swamp, there's a free dock at the Welcome Center. And there's another one at the South Mills Lock. So if you're getting close to the end of the day, and you probably will be by the time you get to the South Mills Lock, uh, you can just tie up there before you continue on to Elizabeth City. Um, also, there is a free dock at the Deep Creek Lock, immediately past the lock on the right-hand side. And a little bit further on, just south of the bridge that's after the lock, there's another free dock there. And I'm guessing, I think you could probably tie up two boats at that one and probably four at the first one. The advantage of the, the, second, um, uh, the second free dock uh, just south of the bridge you're right close to a, a real decent Mexican restaurant. Um, I think there's a Napa, there's a hardware store, there's a grocery store. So everything's within a reasonable walking distance. He's under 50 times. Did I hear somebody asking a question there? Or, whoops. Okay. Um, okay, where was I? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, now if you're looking for information on anchorages, a good resource for anchoring is the Skipper Bob Publications Anchorages book, which is updated fairly regularly, although I don't believe it's updated annually. Now, it also is sold by Waterway Guides. It's quite a bit less expensive than the guides themselves. Uh, if you're going to be doing any anchoring at all, I recommend that you get it. Um, it's uh, I think it's $21 currently. Now, this is an old picture. It says $17. If you can find them, and they're hard to find. Oops, hang on a second. If you can find them, whoop. Okay, there we go. If you can find a copy of On the Water Chart Guides, which were written by Mark, uh, Captain Mark, and um, I can't think of his wife's name off the top of my head, Mark and, um, wasn't that awful? Mark and Diana Boyle. Those were first, first published six or seven, maybe eight years ago, maybe a bit more than that even. Very, very good resort, although the resource, although they are dated. But you can probably find them on, on eBay if you look for them. Um, you might find one in a, a, a used bookstore in a, in a marine location. Uh, you might even find one on the shelves of a, a local chandlery. But excellent, excellent resource. Just remember that it's dated, so it's not going to be 100% up to date. Okay. Um, so going from mile zero through to North Carolina. Tonight we're going to get as far as Beaufort. Um, if you go the Dismal Swamp route from Hampton to Norfolk to the Dismal Swamp route, if you're leaving from Hampton, you're going to have to leave about 7 o'clock to make the 11 o'clock lock, okay? Uh, you want to catch the 11 o'clock lock if you expect to make Elizabeth City the same day. Uh, if you miss it, then you'll probably tie up at South Mills and make uh, Elizabeth City the following day. Um, when you tie up at Elizabeth City, keep in mind that if there's a south wind, especially a strong south wind, you do not want to tie up on the north side of the bridge at the city docks, okay? It can get really, really rough. So if there's any kind of a south wind, stay on the north side of the bridge. And there's free docks at the Christian College um, if they're available. They weren't today, so I'm docked a little bit further down at a place called Jeanette's, which is immediately before the bridge, okay? Um, so, okay, uh, from Elizabeth City, you would carry on to the bottom of the Alligator Pungo Canal for, for your anchorage. And we'll come to that in a minute. From Hampton, Norfolk via the Virginia Cut, again, you want to leave early and you'll make it to Great Bridge. And then from Great Bridge, you'll go to Coin Jock the next day. And you want to make sure that you pick up either a t-shirt or one of those little um, oval-shaped bumper stickers that says, where the hell is Coin Jock, uh, North Carolina? Uh, Coin Jock typically is very busy. It's a choke point on the ICW. Uh, you want to be sure that you call ahead for dockage. I have to start making all these late arrivals, bring notes or something as a teacher. Anyhow, where was I? Okay, so make sure that you call ahead to Coinjock for dockage. Um, 
and when it gets real, real busy, they, they may end up rafting you up. Uh, from Sundock, you would again go down to the bottom of the Alligator Pungo Canal for anchorage. You can also anchor or dock at the Alligator River Bridge, as I mentioned. Oh, yes. No, I, if we, Alligator River Bridge is halfway through. It's at the uh, the meeting of the Albemarle Sound and the Alligator Pungo River. I was just there today, actually. I, I anchored there this morning or last night. Um, you can anchor on either side of the bridge, depending on the wind, of course. Uh, the marine entrance, if you need fuel, is known to be shallow. So before you try entering, make sure that you call them and, and make sure that they can handle your draft. This morning, I saw um, about a 42-foot hunter in there, uh, but that's probably a five-foot draft, uh, five draft boat and, and wouldn't have had too much trouble getting in there. Anyhow, so that brings us down to the Alligator River Bridge. Oh, the other thing you want to be sure of, and I got caught that way this morning. When I left, I was on the um, the south side of the bridge. So when I left and I came up to the bridge for the opening, I'd managed to pick up a crab pot without seeing it. I think what happened, my boat swung over a crab pot last night. And uh, I've discovered that a, a crab pot stuck on your keel will slow you down by at least a knot and a half. Anyhow, I didn't have to go swimming to get rid of it. Fortunately, I stopped the boat, backed up, and, um, and the, the crab pot fell off. Okay. From, <clears throat> excuse me, from Alligator Pungo River to Beaufort, North Carolina. On the right-hand side is the anchorage at the bottom of the Alligator Pungo uh, section, the Albemarle Alligator Pungo. This is at about mile 100. There are several anchorages here. One at the lower end, if you've got um, a south wind, it's fine. An east or west wind is okay. Uh, a north wind, it's not where you want to be because you've got a really long fetch that will end up in that bay and make things a little lumpy. Um, one of the exciting parts about being anchored in this area, by the way, very often the uh, the uh, nearby uh, Air Force field will have jets flying over. I saw several of them today, and you get quite the air show for free. Another spot you can anchor is this middle one here, just opposite the point. Um, it's a bit of a smaller one. There's no shore access at all there, just as there's no shore access at the first one I showed you. There is a third anchorage right at Tuckahoe Point proper, which is that little point there where the third arrow is. Um, and if you're looking for a place to walk your dog, hop in the dinghy and go around that last point and go up to where the, the fourth arrow, the short arrow is, there's a little dock there. You have to go down, you have to go down this little creek. You, you'll see the, 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 the red and green marker boys. And then just follow this little creek right up to the end. And there's a little dock there and a little boat ramp. Um, and if you hear banders, I suggest that you get the hell out of there because you may be in trouble. It's kind of got that, um, that vibe to it. Uh, it's a fair ways up there, but uh, it's a nice little walk up there, a couple farms and that, but it's a good spot to take your dog for a walk if you need to. So, um, now as you come further down, the once you go on to the Alligator Pungo Canal, remember if you end up behind a barge or a tug, a big boat like that, there's, there's deadheads and such in the bottom. A big boat will churn up a lot of crap on the bottom. So for some reason, you end up behind a barge stay way back because those big props and those things will pick up the garbage on the bottom and you don't want them hitting your boat. If you're running a power boat, you want to keep your speed down because you there's enough deadheads that if you hit one uh, running at, at 20 knots, you're going to do some significant damage to your boat. So anyhow, nope, nothing there. Sorry, just checking to see if there are any, uh, any messages. Okay, um, there is no anchorage at all on the Alligator Pungo Canal. There's no dockage. Once you enter it, you, uh, you're you going to run all the way through. There is an anchorage at the south end of the Alligator Pungo Canal on the right-hand side. Uh, quite a pleasant anchorage. It's open to um, south and west winds, but it's pretty decent from the north and the east. There's an anchorage at Dowry Creek, uh, just past the marina there, uh, but not too far past because it shallows out fairly quickly. There's also an anchorage at Bell Haven, um, and that's shown on your charts. There are also several marinas in the area. The one I recommend is Dowry Creek Marina. They're wonderful people. I, I spent a couple of days there just last weekend. Um, they're, they're really great people, very friendly. They have a wonderful new restaurant. Uh, the food's really, really good. Um, just, uh, oh, and free laundry. They have free laundry. <laughs> and by the time you get there, you're going to need to have some laundry done. Okay, they have a lovely um, captain's room as well. So that brings us to um, Bellhaven. Moving on from Bellhaven. Okay, as I meant, well, okay, what have I done here? Hang on, bear with me, folks. There we go. Okay. Okay, uh, you, 
from the Alligator Pungo to Beaufort, North Carolina. There's a dinghy dock in Belhaven, which is just past the Belhaven Marina. Uh, there's a dinghy dock at Dowry Creek. If you decide to tie out, you can dinghy in and, and go to the restaurant from the dinghy dock. From Belhaven to Oriental or even to Beaufort <clears throat> is a fairly easy run with no significant challenges. Uh, there are no shoal spots, no, uh, no difficult things, very minimal current until you get close to Beaufort. There are a lot of anchorages in almost every creek along the way, and you'll see those on your chart. They're fairly obvious. Um, Beaufort itself has got a very large anchorage, uh, and there's a dinghy dock near the post office. Now, bridge issues. <laughs> I mentioned that I was going to, um, to, to explain what the bridge issues are on the way down. In this whole section, there are three bridges that can pose a problem. Pongo Ferry and the Atlantic Yacht Basin, which are on the um, the um, Virginia Cut Route, and the Wilkerson Bridge, which is down uh, just north of um, of the Dowry Creek at the bottom of the um, the bottom of the Alligator Pongo Canal. Your maximum air draft on the ICW, which basically becomes important, is more important in the north end than the south end because you have more tide or less tide in the north end, is about sixty four and a quarter feet. 64 and a quarter feet will get under the bridge at Wilkerson under normal conditions, just barely. If you've got any jewelry on the top of your mast, um, you're going to want to you're going to want to go climb the mast before you get there and take the jewelry off and take your VHF antenna and flip it upside down, you know, until you're off the ICW. And the reason you do that, your your VHF will still work perfectly fine for the range. You'll you lose a bit of range, of course, but it'll work perfectly fine. It will not be hitting any bridge tops if you've got a really high mast. Uh, as for the jewelry, you guys know how expensive that stuff is, uh, so you want to take any any um, any of the gear off there. There is no tide in this area that will assist you in getting under a bridge, so you want to you want to pay attention to that. There's a wind driven tidal effect that will sometimes help. Typically, a south wind on the Wilkerson or on the Alligator Pungo will drop the depths anywhere as much as six inches to a foot. Okay, the Atlantic Yacht Basin. When you're going through the bridge uh, just south, which you see at the upper right-hand corner here, um, that's the bridge at the Atlantic Yacht Basin. It has been known to, uh, when there's high water, it's been known to be a problem. There is a yellow ribbon hanging, and the song's going through your head now, isn't it? There's a yellow ribbon hanging down opposite of the Atlantic Yacht Basin, which is about 300 yards past the free dock. The free dock is shown by the arrow, okay? If that yellow ribbon is not in the water, you have 65 feet at the bridge. If it's in the water and you have a tall mast, then I suggest you contact the dock master at the Atlantic Yacht Basin and ask him for his advice on what, what height you should be expecting at that bridge. The Pungo Ferry Bridge, which is further down past here, is usually not an issue up to 64 and a quarter feet. Uh, when you get there, there's um, there's there's not, nobody to tell you what the situation is there. There's um, no facilities, no marinas, anything nearby. If you feel it's going to be a problem, then one thing you can do is take your dinghy, tie it onto your your the boom of your boat, raise it out of the, fill it with water and raise it out of your um, raise it out of the water. That will pull your boat over enough to get you under most bridges. Okay, the Wilkerson Bridge. This is a tough one. Now that picture, this guy, this is not the Wilkerson Bridge, but well maybe it is now that I look at it. Anyway, this guy took a couple of weather balloons, filled them with water. And if you see the video, if you look at the video on this, it's amazing. It shows him doing this. He starts fully upright with the weather balloons right beside the boat. He starts to tilt them over to get them out. And the weather balloons, as you can see, have gone way out to the side of the boat and have healed his boat way over. And he actually sails at speed under that bridge. And you look at the guy and you just think, like, that guy's got more nerve than anybody I know. And it's just an amazing video. It's uh, I, I looked for it and I couldn't find the link, but I didn't have a lot of time. You might have more success than I did. Anyway, the Wilkerson Bridge. Contact the Dowry Creek Marina for advice on the available height of the bridge. They monitor it, and they have a um, a gauge at their um, uh, a board at their uh, their marina where they can look at it, and they'll and they'll correlate that to the depths that you'll see at the bridge. When I went through uh, a couple of days ago, it was um, just under sixty five feet of depth. Now I only draw forty eight, so it didn't matter. But I looked at it for anybody here who's looking for a, a, who has a tall mast. There's also a hydrographic chart that is available online that will tell you what the depths are and, or the heights are, excuse me. And the other thing that that will do, it will show you the, the pattern of what's coming. You know, you can see whether the depths in the, at the bridge are going up or they're going down. Uh, the link is right there. 
Now the water height here is tide driven, is not tide driven, pardon me. It's uh, wind driven, my mistake. The north winds will raise the water level sometimes as much as six inches to a foot. So if, you've, if you're coming into this thing and you've got a tall mast and there's been a lot of north winds, then you wanna definitely be a little more cautious. Okay, now I mentioned that I was gonna teach you how to time bridges. This is a trick that I've been using for a long, long time and it makes life a lot easier. North Carolina is where this especially becomes handy because there's series of bridges that are, are, are in the way there. Um, first off, set up a route on your chart plot, okay? And you know, just set up your different waypoints to each place that you turn on the ICW. Now, what you wanna do is set a go-to point at the next bridge that you're coming to. So let's say the next bridge is 13 miles. So you set a go-to point at that. Your chart plotter will then tell you based on the route you set, what your estimated time of arrival will be there, okay? Now let's say that you wanna, let's say that you, um, you wanna hit the 11 o'clock opening of the bridge. So you set up your route, you set up your go-to point, and you're, you're motoring along and the chart plotter says, well, you're gonna arrive at 11.10. Obviously you're gonna miss the bridge. So you can speed up and the chart plotter will adjust its estimated time of arrival. What your goal is, is to adjust your speed so that you arrive about 10 minutes in advance, okay? And the reason you want to get 10 minutes in advance, oops, the reason you want to get 10 minutes, 10 minutes in advance is because the current is going to affect your speed. Now, what you want to do is when you start this, speed up, run a little faster so that maybe your, your chart product shows you're gonna be 15 minutes in advance of the bridge. <clears throat> the reason you do that, especially in North Carolina, is that as you go down the ICW, the different inlets are gonna be pushing you and then they're gonna be slowing you down. And if they're pushing you, they're gonna be slowing you down. And you'll go back and forth like this, half a dozen, eight, 10 times, depending on what the tide is at the, time, at the period you're going through. So, your chart plotter might be showing that you're going to arrive 15 minutes in advance. You go past an inlet and suddenly it says you're going to be arriving two minutes ahead of time. Okay. So you want to pick up some speed. So you've got a cushion. You can always slow down. You can't always speed up. Okay. Especially if you've got a boat like mine, I'm, I'm a five and a half knot boat all day long. Okay. Now, if you can't make the necessary speed to get to the bridge for your 11 o'clock plan, then what you have to do is slow down a bit and, and set, settle for the 1130 opening, for example. But once you get used to doing this, it makes it a whole lot easier. Now, if you're like, if you're like me and you're too lazy to plot an ICW route in your chart, chart plotter, because it's, it's a little bit of work, um, what I'll usually do is just set the go-to point for the bridge, which of course is a straight line and it's irrespective of any curse in the ICW. And what I then do is I aim for an arrival time of 10 to 15 minutes in advance of the, um, the bridge opening. And that way, I can I can account for any of the curves that are going. Um, now, the first few times I did this, I, I missed the bridges until I picked up the tricks to it. It's not hard, it makes life easier, and it keeps you from having to go around and around in circles waiting at the bridge until the bridge finally opens. Whoop. Okay, do we have any questions or comments? I'm gonna, if I could figure out, just use the, uh, the app here and, and do the hand raise thing and I'll open this up here. Um, stop here, there we go. Bingo, got it. Okay, do we have any questions on this? This has been a short of a, a quick section. For those of you who came in late, because I know there were several people who came in late today, um, this will be put online. Uh, I'll uh, give the link uh, on YouTube for um, on sailing and cruising a little bit later on this evening. So that if you've uh, if you missed the, uh, the first part of the session, you can catch up on it, on it there. And there's Ed Colhane. How's Ed Colhane? I see you online all the time. Okay. Do we have any questions, folks? Oh, Andrew from SV Indy. I've still down the Bahamas. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, nope. Okay. I don't see any questions either. I, I either I did a terrible job or I did a great job, and everybody's got all their questions answered. Anything we anything anybody needs to know? Anything personal to your boat? Um, any anchorages you want to know about? Marinas? Anything like that? Yes, no. Okay, folks, um, that was uh, short and sweet. Thanks very much. Um, I'll be doing another session next uh, Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we'll finish North Carolina and we'll get into South Carolina. Uh, and if there's time, we'll skip Georgia, which I did in the first um, in the first session a couple of weeks ago, 
and we'll get into northern Florida. Okay, so uh, Wally, the yellow, yes. Oh uh, yeah, um, I've I've been getting to know Aquamaps a little bit, and I, I found that as I drill into marinas and um, anchorages and that, there's a lot of information available right there online. There is. Is that is that less than or equivalent to what's in Waterway Guide? Well, here's the best part. Uh, if you've been using Aquamaps and you have the master version, the Waterway Guide information is available on Aquamaps. That's what I was thinking, but I wanted to, to ask to be verify that. Yes, yes. Um, what you'll do is you'll get you'll get the online information that Waterway Guide has online, and you'll get it on the Aquamaps itself. So um, I don't have the screenshot handy, but when you go into Aquamaps, if you click the Waterway Guide app on and put it on, what will happen is it'll show a little Waterway Guide symbol or a little anchor or a little marina symbol. And you click on that, and it'll open it up, and it'll give you the the information that you need to know about that particular marina. Um, it'll also give you anchorage information, too, for where there's anchorages. Um, and you can then open that up, and you can see reviews that people have given on the marina. You can see uh, the depths. You can see the availability uh, and what facilities they have available. So the Aquamaps is really handy for that. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we talked about Aquamaps uh, a week ago, but uh, it's one of the very best apps out there for for boaters. I, I I use it all the time myself now. I don't use it at the helm. I use my chart plotter, but I, I use it for a lot for planning and such. And and I have used it for um, I have used it at the helm from time to time, but uh, I have to use it on my phone, and I find the phone a little too bit too small for doing actual real navigation. Thanks. No problem. Glad to help. Anybody else? Any other questions? Oh, any sessions covering Sandy Hook to Cape May? Ed, um, we talked a little bit about the um, the um, Jersey Coast a couple of weeks ago. But to make it easy, Ed, um, when you leave Sandy Hook, you want to leave on the outgoing tide about an hour after the tide set, starts going out at New York. Because what you want to do is you want to get the most possible speed rolling off. Now, you can either do it as a, a one-time jump. Uh, it's about 100 and... Let's say 120 miles to Cape May from New York, from Sandy Hook to New York, I should say. So you can do that as an overnight run. Uh, alternatively, you can do it by breaking it up, going into Barnegat, Manasquin, uh, Atlantic City, and then Cape May. Uh, those are the four inlets that are, are usable for most boats. Something to remember is that if you're going in at uh, any of these Jersey inlets, make sure that you're not getting into a wind against tide situation or that you've got any strong northeast or northerly winds or Southeast for that matter, because those inlets can get just vicious. I mean, seriously vicious. You'll get standing waves of four and five feet inside them when you have a, a wind against current situation. Um, the other thing is I, I've got to recommend is that when you go into any of these Jersey inlets, follow the markers religiously, okay? Like go to the sea boy, pay attention and follow them in. Don't, don't deviate. Uh, I made that mistake coming in Atlantic City, my first trip south from Canada to, um, to uh, Chesapeake Bay. And uh, it got a little, it got a little scary. I, uh, I damn near grounded the boat out <clears throat> because I, there was a shoal that was unmarked on the charts that I had, and the charts I had were only two years old, but they, they hadn't been updated. So, um, and when you come into Cape May, uh, remember that there is a, um, a jetty coming out at Cape May. You want them to stay far enough out. The other thing is that if your boat draw has more than a fifty-five foot mast, you're going to have to go around Cape May. Um, you can't get into Cape May. Cape May has, I can see somebody nodding his head there. You've obviously been there and done that. Yep. Um, there's a couple of nice anchorages in Cape May. And the only problem with Cape May, is anybody here from New Jersey before I say what I'm going to say? New Jersey has the worst power boaters in the world, by far. Rude, impolite. They go roaring past you. They throw up wakes. It doesn't matter. And the Atlantic, uh, the Cape May uh, anchorage is a little unpleasant on weekends for that reason. Uh, they just constantly go by throwing up huge wakes. But other than that, it's a, it's a great little city to explore. Uh, if you're when you're going up the Delaware River, um, if you've got a strong wind out of the north, you want the current behind you for that one because it's a strong current. So when you're you're going up the Delaware River, if you've got a strong north wind against that current, you might want to spend an extra day or so in Cape May, and that's not the worst thing in the world that can happen. A couple of good restaurants there, a couple of decent pubs. I can see him nodding his head again. Yes, he knows this. <laughs> yes, right there in the middle. I don't. I can't see the name. Oh yeah, G Watt. There we go. Um, so yeah, and the other thing about when you're going up, Ed, when you're going up the Delaware River, leave the Cape May Canal about an hour to an hour and a half after the tide shifts and is pushing behind you. That will give you a huge boost and get you up to the uh, the C and D Canal quite quickly. 
Okay. Um, wondering how, oh, Ed, um, I have no idea how many do that. The tall boats probably would do it because it makes sense for them. Um, but most people like to do the, uh, I, I hate the Delaware personally. It's the worst piece of water that I could possibly think. It's not because it's shallow or anything. It's just, it's not attractive. Uh, lots of freighter traffic. But if you stay on the edge, it's not a big deal. Uh, and the nice part about it is that when you pop out of the C&D Canal at the other end into the Chesapeake Bay, you've got all those nice little towns like Havre de Grasse and 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 the um, Succotash or whatever, whatever river it is starts with an S. Lots of great little places to visit. You got the Baltimore Harbor, which is a one of the most attractive downtown harbors going. You got Annapolis, of course. Um, you got um, Tangier Island. You got Reedville. Um, if if it's your first trip, I really recommend that you you take the the um, the Delaware up to the top of the Chesapeake Bay and do some exploring on the way down. Okay, we got any other questions there? No, that's about it. Okay, any other questions? Yes, there is. Always stay out. Oh, uh, oh, I see. That's uh, G. Watt. So you've always stayed outside. How did you find it? Is there any? No, I've not. I'm going to put you on. I'll take your uh, your mute off for a second. Here. There we go. Would you tell the people what running? From, I've never done that section of it. I've always done the Delaware. Could you tell people what the section is running from the Cape May down to um, to Norfolk? My, my experience has been coming out of uh, Liberty Landing Marina, just outside in New York City. Yep. You know, rounding, um, you know, New Jersey there and Sandy Hook and then just hugging the coast, you know, and, and I've done this a couple of times and made it to the Chesapeake and uh, one time actually in the Chesapeake and up to Deltaville in about 52 hours. It's an easy overnight run, you know, as long as you have a uh, crew on board to assist with that. I've actually had the C&D Canal which uh, I always plan for as an off-ramp to come back inside. But I've actually had it closed on me uh, due to fog. Uh, and so that option was taken away. You know, we just had to stay offshore. Um, but that run is really, really quite easy. I, I don't necessarily see the need for the safety factor of messing with the Jersey inlets uh, to run on the inside. Oh, no, no, I'm not talking about running on the inside. I'm talking about running in the inlets, anchoring or going to a marina, and then coming back out. Uh, sailboats can't do the inside because the bridge heights are too low, and typically the, the thing is too shallow. Yeah, exactly. that, if you say the Liberty Landing, you must be really rich, because that, <laughs> that is probably the most expensive marina in north of Florida I have ever been in. I couldn't believe the cost. Yeah, well, as you know, Wally, I'm at uh, Safe Harbor Blue Water there in Hampton, uh, as is Ron Charlton, who's also on this. And, uh, you know, one month at Liberty Landing was like our annual lease at Blue Water. <laughs> I can believe it. But they've got the nicest bathrooms. I mean, holy, it seems like an expensive men's club is what it seems like. Uh, the services there are incredible. They on are. Top, they are. Heads, et cetera. What I usually do, because I'm a cheap Canadian sailor, is I stop in uh, to the north of New York. And I stay at the Nyack Boat Club, and they've got moorings there. There's no, no docks, but they got moorings where you can anchor out. And the nice part about it is the first time I went in, this is why I love it. The first time I, I tied up there, anchored up there, I should say, I, I dinghied into shore and I walked to shore. And it was a Saturday afternoon, and the yacht club was having a party. Some guy walks up to me and he puts a burger in my hand and he puts a beer in my other hand. And he says, Welcome. Can we take you to the grocery store later? And I thought, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> really wonderful people there, really wonderful people. And the nice part about it is that. You can leave your boat there. You can run across and grab the, the train and you can run down to New York and not have to deal with all the New York bullshit uh, and burned and trying to anchor at 79th Street Bridge or or losing an annual year's annual income at the Liberty Landing. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Now, when you went down the uh, the Jersey, uh, not the Jersey, the Delaware coast, did you, anchor, you, you just went straight. You didn't try any of the inlets. You didn't try to anchor out or go to the marinas? No, we went straight through. I was bringing that boat down from Montreal, roughly out of Rouse's Point sailed down Lake Champlain, took the stick down two days through the Champlain Canal, put the stick back up to Liberty Landing, and then ran offshore once we had a weather window. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it was a delivery. Was it a delivery or just uh, having fun? Uh, it was a delivery. Yeah, I kind of thought so by the sound of it. Yeah, the, I, was, I didn't mention it, but the, um, we're talking about the, uh, the um, inlets in uh, the Jersey Coast. I was doing delivery one time. I come out of Cape May and we'd had some pretty rough weather, but it cleared up. The winds were behind us. 
um, couldn't sail because the boat that was delivering their sails were ratty. And the minute I put the main sail up, it just tore to shreds. So we're motoring along and I've got a young guy, he's 17, uh, the son of a friend of mine who's crewing for me. And he's starting to go the color green because it's, it's a little rocky. We're in a, a PDQ catamaran. And I, know if, uh, I don't know how many of you have catamarans, but their motion in a following sea, it's a little upsetting. It, it's back and it's forth and it's around. And anyway, I, I mean, my stomach was feeling a little rough too. Anyway, he, he, was, he was definitely a shade of green. And he looked at me and he says, Wally, I, I, I really need to get off. I mean, we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You can't really get off. So I said, look, we'll call ahead to Barnegat and we'll see if we can get in there. So I called ahead to the Coast Guard. And this is something to keep in mind. I said, what are the conditions like at the Barnegat Inlet? And he says, well, you know, we don't really discuss that because that makes us liable. Uh, he didn't say it in those words, but he didn't give us a lot of information. And about 30 seconds later, SeaTo uh, or Boat US, I forget which one, got on the radio and he says, you don't want to be coming in here. He says, there's a six foot standing wave. It's rough. And I had to look at this poor young man and I said, look, I'm sorry. I said, we can't stop. But I promise you, when we get to New York, we'll anchor off the Statue of Liberty, which is what we did. And he was just thrilled to death. He's got a picture that, that I took of him with the Statue of Liberty behind him sitting on, while, while he's on the, on the back of the boat. He was just thrilled to death. The fun part that morning, you can anchor, you have to stay more than 75 yards, I think is the limit from the, from the statue. And when we anchored, we anchored, it was, it was dark. And that night when the tide shifted, it brought me within the 75 yard limit. So, so that morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock, way earlier than I wanted to get there, there's a knock in the hall and it's the Coast Guard telling me I have to move the boat. So they were really understanding about the situation. I said, is it okay if I have coffee? First is yet, yeah, have your coffee. He says, put your, you know, put your glasses on and, and do whatever you have to do and then just move the boat over. So, um, which is what we did. But both the, the young man and I are Canadian, and it was just really a thrill to anchor outside the, the Statue of Liberty, one of those, you know, world-famous type uh, iconic things. So really enjoyed that. Okay. Um, any other questions, folks? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Like Next week, as I said, we'll finish talking about the anchorages and such in North Carolina. Uh, we'll get into South Carolina. We'll talk about um, some of the shoaling areas and, and the challenges there. Uh, so that you know how to get through them with the minimum of problems. And then if we have time, if that doesn't take too long, we'll skip over into North Florida. And then the week after that, we'll finish Florida and talk about uh, crossing to the Bahamas. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night.